Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ron Priebus. You can see in the in my picture there. Uh, this is the uh, third annual Elan Sasso Memorial Lecture on uh, Jewish Mizrahi culture and history. Uh, if you recall, the last two years we had Marina Rustow and Michael Wexler speak. And this year we're gratified to have Jonathan Kaufman uh, and more on him in a moment. I'd like to briefly remember Ilana. Uh, Ilana was born to Iraqi parents in Israel and grew up and was educated there through her army service, college and a master's degree. I was fortunate to meet her there and we moved to the US. She was always interested in her Iraqi roots, uh, language and everything Mizrahi, including music, literature and cooking. She got a chance to follow this passion in her work studying Judeo-Arabic and getting a PhD in Bible and ancient Semitic languages from JTS. She specialized in medieval commentaries on the Bible by Karaites in Judeo-Arabic. This resulted in her book on the commentaries of Yefet Ben and Lee on the book of Proverbs. She also taught Bible and comparative religion at Sacred Heart University and at JTS. Uh, I wanted to just share, um, let's see, how do I do this now? Share a few pictures of Ilana since I have the computer. Um, so let me just do that quickly. So you should be able to see it now. So this is Ilana in her library. Um, this is her doing one of her uh, favorite hobbies, uh, bird watching. Um, and this is her in high school. So this is her in the front, if you can see that. So uh, you can see this is an unruly Israeli high school, uh, but I should also note that she went to a top school meant specially to educate Mizrahi kids. So I think it's kind of a nice old picture. Okay, I'm gonna unshare now. Um, okay, now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor to Jonathan Kaufman, Professor Kaufman. He's presently the director of the School of Journalism at Northeastern University. He has a long esteemed history as a reporter and editor. He started with the Boston Globe and won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for local reporting, examining racism and job discrimination in Boston. He was also the Berlin bureau chief for the Boston Globe. Later, he was an editor for the Wall Street Journal and was the Wall Street Journal's China uh, bureau chief. He joined Bloomberg News, serving as executive editor for Company News, overseeing more than 300 reporters and editors, covering a wide range of issues. Uh, and his team won many prizes, including another Pulitzer Prize. He joined Northeastern in 2015. He's had an interest in Jewish topics, writing two books before the present one. The first titled, A Hole in the Heart of the World, Being Jewish in Eastern Europe, and the second, Broken Alliance, The Turbulent Times Between Blacks and Jews in America, which won the National Jewish Book Award. His latest book, The Last Kings of Shanghai, is about Iraqi Jews who made their way to China and had a lasting impact. It's a saga of success, but also survival through the history of colonialism to the momentous events of the 20th century, including World War II, the Holocaust, and the rise of communist China. I'm glad to have Jonathan here to tell us more about it. Um, We'll have questions. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and he'll answer them afterwards. And we'll hopefully also have some time for some uh, oral direct questions. Okay, Jonathan, it's all yours. Great. I'll try to pin you here. Good. The center of attention. Go okay. ahead. Uh, Ron, thanks very much. I'm really honored um, to be doing this and, and also to honor um, Ilana's memory, because I think that um, the history of the Iraqi Jews is, is somewhat lost, even among those who follow Jewish history. We all know the Fiddler on the Roof story about, um, you know, Jews uh, in Europe and later in America, who were often uh, born in ghettos or in poor circumstances, and then kind of you know, move up um, and, and achieve great prominence. But the story of the Iraqi Jews um, is really a remarkable one. Um, and I think one that, that deserves wider telling. Um, and these families, I think, really epitomize that. So I'm, I'm glad to be able to share 
um, some of the a sense of the place where Alana came from, uh, but also some of the spirit um, that animated um, the Jews um, who uh, who got their start in Iraq and and inherited a lot of the um, energy and um, and brilliance, frankly, um, that that these families showed as well. Um, you know, I think very often people start off by saying, "How did you?" come up with this topic. I mean, what's with Jews in Israel? Uh, what's with Jews in China? It's not something that we think about very much. Um, and um, the story really begins um, back in the late 1970s, um, when I was a very young reporter just starting out uh, as a foreign correspondent in China. Um, I was right out of college. Um, and I was on my first reporting trip to China in 1979. Um, and as you recall back then, I mean, this was old communist China. Um, everybody on the street was wearing Mao suits. Uh, Mao himself had just died a few years before. Um, the US had not even established relations um, with China the first time I went there. Um, and I was walking along in Shanghai um, along the Bund, which is that very dramatic um, uh, uh, waterfront uh, street um, and uh, with all the Art Deco buildings. And there were many more bicycles on the street than cars. And I was looking for a place to go to the bathroom. And so I stepped into this hotel and it was like stepping from a black and white movie into a 1930s movie set. The inside of this hotel was extraordinary. The floors were marble. There were Lalique chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. There was a bellhop all dressed in white with a little white cap on top. And when I asked him in English where the bathroom was, he responded to me in French. And so I, I kind of stood there and I, I tried to figure out like what, what was this place that, that seemed to be plopped from the 1930s into the middle of, into the middle of red China. Um, I found out later that it had been built by a, a Jewish billionaire, a Jewish playboy um, who had lived in China um, in the 1920s and 1930s named Victor Sassoon. Um, and I kind of filed that away. You always file away little bits and pieces of information uh, as, a, as a reporter. And then um, later when I was traveling back to China, uh, several of the um, Chinese officials would always want to take you to places that were, you know, that were considered safe for journalists. They told a good story about China. So um, they took me at one point, they called it the Children's Palace. And this was a place they said where there were uh, children taking music lessons and children uh, taking ballet lessons. And it would be sort of a nice positive story about China. Um, so I went there because you know you, you wanted to stay on the good side um, of the Chinese government. And it was a beautiful mansion. It was almost like an English country house in the middle of, uh, in the middle of Shanghai. And inside the ballroom was about as long as a football field. Uh, every room was gorgeously decorated and there were indeed Chinese kids taking lessons there. And as I was leaving, I noticed a small plaque at the entrance. Uh, and the plaque said that this had once been the home of the Kaduri family. Um, now I knew the Kaduri name because at that point I was based in Hong Kong. This was in the 1980s. And um, the Kaduris were one of the most prominent uh, families in Hong Kong, also a Jewish family. Uh, they were incredibly wealthy, incredibly influential. And the idea that they had lived in Shanghai back in the 1920s, 1930s was also something I, I hadn't fully realized. Then um, when uh, in the 2000s, 2005, 2006, I moved back to China um, for a third time and lived there with my family, uh, my wife and our three children. Um, as the bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal. And we often traveled to Shanghai. The kids really loved going there. And at one point we were traveling around and um, we ended up in this kind of poor neighborhood um, uh, just to the north of the Bund. And as we walked along, I noticed that in these alleyways with these kind of rundown Chinese tenements almost, there were shadows of mezuzahs on the doorposts um, of many of the homes. And I couldn't quite figure out what was that about. Um, and of course, as I learned later, these were mezuzahs that had been left by the 18,000 Jewish refugees who had fled Vienna and Berlin during World War II and had been given shelter in Shanghai um, and, uh, and survived there during the Holocaust and uh, then had left when the communists took over. And all that really remained were the, the shadows of these mezuzahs they had once put on the doorposts of their house. 
So this got me thinking that there had to be a, a story here and, and, and it was something that I didn't really know about. Um, and the story took me um, to Baghdad. Um, Baghdad was where I started. Um, and um, I, I kind of learned about the Sassoon family. Um, now, as I said, I, we were very familiar with the story of Jews who come from Europe and the European ghettos and the Jews who come from America. Um, but the Baghdad story was certainly new to me. And um, the Jews in Baghdad had actually been brought there by Nebuchadnezzar, um, you know, a couple of thousand years ago after the destruction of the temple. And these were the Jews we read about in the Bible who by the rivers of Babylon wept when they remembered Zion. Um, Baghdad was Babylon. That was the name for Baghdad back then. And the more I dug into it, the more it was clear that while the, the Jews of Baghdad uh, might have wept remembering Jerusalem, they also were extraordinarily successful. They were successful um, in terms of uh, the economy, uh, in terms of their learning. Um, there was uh, all sorts of, of incredible growth. And, and in some ways, Baghdad was the, the site of the first diaspora. These were Jews who um, had been expelled, had been kidnapped from Jerusalem, but then built another life for themselves um, in, uh, in Babylon, in Baghdad. Um, and in fact, they were so successful that the various rulers of Baghdad, whether they were the Turks or the Persians, the Ottomans, would turn to the Jews and rely on them to um, be their most successful merchants and also to seek advice for them um, on economic matters. And um, the most prominent Jewish family, which was called the Nasi, N-A-S-I, um, would regularly advise the Pasha, the rulers of Baghdad, on economic matters. He was sort of like the secretary of the treasury. And he was so well respected um, that whenever he went to meet with the Pasha, he would be carried through the streets of Baghdad uh, in a sedan chair. Um, and as he passed, um, members of Baghdad's community, both Jews and non-Jews would, would bow their heads in respect. So these were the Sassoons. The Sassoons were named the Nasi. Um, they were the most prominent family and the wealthiest family. Um, living in Baghdad. Um, they were enormously successful. They had trade routes um, throughout the Middle East. Um, now, as things often happen with Jews, the politics turned against them uh, in the 1820s and 1830s. And uh, members of the Sassoon family started being kidnapped um, by the government. They were held for ransom. And David Sassoon, uh, who's the patriarch of the family at this point, was all ready to basically take over this dynasty. He was in his 30s, um, about to take over from his father, and um, he was kidnapped um, and held for ransom. And his father recognized that things were probably going to continue along this way, and he had to get his son out. So he went to the jail, ransomed his son, and hustled him down to the waterfront, where he put him on a boat that would take him uh, out of Baghdad and to safety. Um, but before he left, he put a cloak over David, over his son, that was lined with pearls. So he would have something uh, to help start um, his new life. So David sailed away from Baghdad um, and he uh, landed uh, eventually in Bombay. And the very first night that he spent uh, away from Baghdad, this young man who was supposed to inherit this business dynasty, uh, slept on the floor of a warehouse with a gun by his side so he could shoot the rats that were scurrying by. So in some ways, I find this story not to be the sort of familiar one that we, we remember um, of, say, the Rothschilds or, or, or of others. It's really almost Shakespearean. It's almost the story of a prince who loses his birthright and then spends uh, the rest of his life and, and, and his family's future trying to reclaim their position. Now, David Sassoon landed in India um, right at the time when the British were uh, arriving and turning India into a colony. And David was very impressed by the British. He felt that they had a system of laws. Uh, Anti-Semitism was just starting to ease in Britain. And the British were welcoming outsiders, immigrants, people like David Sassoon, to help establish trade routes throughout their growing empire, whether it was India or later China. So David Sassoon gradually got the rest of his family out of Baghdad and went into business um, in, uh, in India. 
Um, because he had been so prominent in Baghdad, many of the traders already knew him. He spoke many languages and he was a, a, just a brilliant businessman. But he also decided that the future lay with Great Britain. And so even though he never spoke English, he taught um, English, he made sure his eight sons all learned English. Um, he made them all citizens of the British Empire. Um, he swore allegiance to Queen Victoria and decided that he would be part of uh, the British uh, uh, system, the British Empire, as it began to expand. He was also, as I say, a very smart businessman and within a number of years had become a millionaire um, in India and quite prominent. And he did a lot of that uh, by buying and selling opium. Now, we have to remember at the time, opium was legal. Um, it was sold in India legally. It was taxed by the British. Um, in, in Great Britain, you could buy opium because aspirin wasn't quite yet invented. And so people would take little bits of opium to relieve aches and pains. Um, and so some of his money he was able to make in opium. And I'll talk a bit later about the impact of that when he, when he goes to China. Um, so David Sassoon was doing very well. The Sassoon family was doing very well. Um, and then in the 1840s, Britain invaded China. And it invaded China because it wanted to open up China to trade. China was completely closed, but there were all these reports of this vast empire in China um, that everyone thought would welcome British goods, including opium. And so um, Britain won two wars against China. And as part of that, China had to open up many of its cities um, to British entrepreneurs, British financiers, British uh, trade people who wanted to settle there. And David Sassoon is a very good and successful businessman thought, well, you know, China is the future. And as I mentioned, he had eight sons. And so his decision was to send these eight sons um, to China um, and especially to Shanghai um, to establish his business empire. Now, I think you have to imagine what it was like. His sons were mostly in their 20s. Um, he sent them off to various cities in China. Um, none of them spoke Chinese. Um, he often sent them with a small group of clerks um, who had been trained to um, uh, make things kosher. Um, they would be able to set up Jewish hospitals. They were kind of setting up a small Jewish community in places like Shanghai that was funded and supported um, by the Sassoons. And David Sassoon, as the, his empire began to expand in China, uh, sent word back to Baghdad that if you were a Jewish family in Baghdad seeking to leave as, as his family had left, the Sassoons would welcome you. And they would tell families that if you sent your sons, and they were always sons, um, to work for the Sassoons, the Sassoons would guarantee that they would get a job, they would educate them. Um, they would make sure that if they got sick, there would be a Jewish hospital. Um, they would build synagogues for them. If they died, there would be a Jewish cemetery. And so many Jewish families uh, began to feel that this was a great opportunity um, for their sons to follow the Sassoons. And one of the families that did that were the Kaduris, the other family that I write about. The Kaduris were not as successful as the Sassoons. Um, they were in fact distant relatives. Um, they'd fallen on hard times because their father had died and their mother was very worried about how the family would survive. And so she sent uh, several of her sons um, to India to work for the Sassoons, one of whom was Eli Kaduri. Eli Kaduri was 15 years old when he left Baghdad, went to Bombay, uh, went to work for the Sassoons, was educated there, and then made his way to Hong Kong and ultimately to China. Um, he was 18 years old. And again, imagine what it must have been like for him, an 18-year-old boy, really, suddenly living in China, not speaking the language, um, and, and, and engaged in, in, in all, sorts of, all sorts of trade. Um, one thing Eli Kaduri quickly realized is that there was a lot of money to be made in China. And so he went off on his own, breaking away from the Sassoons to start trying to build um, his, own, his own fortune. Um, now, one of the things that the Sassoons understood, and this was true of the Kaduris as well, they were incredibly innovative and entrepreneurial. I sometimes think of China as being the Silicon Valley of its time. Uh, the Sassoons began to expand the opium trade, and they did that very successfully by basically using the latest technology 
of the 1800s. So um, the Sassoons would buy steamships and they would use these steamships to take the opium they were buying in India and shipping it to Shanghai. That made them much more efficient and much faster than other companies that were using sailing ships still. The Sassoons were able to beat them by getting the opium to China faster. They also were the first family to use the telegraph. The telegraph was a new invention. The Sassoons uh, heard about it and realized that they could use the telegraph, that the, the sons that were scattered across China could telegraph information to each other and then back to their father in Bombay to find out what prices were doing and, and so forth. And because of their success um, using this technology and a number of other techniques, they were able to essentially drive out all their competitors. Um, and the Sassoons became the dominant sellers uh, of opium in China by about 1870, 1880. Um, and in fact, you know, many years later, when the communists conquered Shanghai, um, they were able to seize the Sassoon business records. Um, and I was able to then see them. And the Chinese calculated that the Sassoons had probably made about a billion dollars in the opium trade which they then converted into real estate and other things. So it was really an astonishing fortune. Now, when I talk to the Sassoons about this today, the descendants of David Sassoon, um, they basically said, well, you know, it was like cigarettes or it was like alcohol. This was a vice um, that was legal as it was. Um, the Chinese wanted opium and so we were just selling it to them. And that's true, opium was legal. Um, but it's also true when I read through the do documents and read through the archives, the Sassoons knew how dangerous opium was. Um, none of the Sassoons ever tried opium. Um, they often had to dismiss some of their Chinese employees because they'd become addicted to opium. And just to understand what it did to China, the, the Chinese empire was very opposed to opium. It, it, it felt it was destroying the country. But because they had lost a war with Great Britain, they had no choice and had to allow this trade. Um, at its height, probably about 12% of China was addicted to opium. And as a point of comparison, about 2% of Americans are addicted to opium, opioids and hard drugs today. And we know the kind of anguish the opioid trade has caused in America, the sort of anger people have towards the Sacklers and others, um, Purdue Pharmaceuticals for selling opioids. So you can imagine a situation where it was six times worse um, and the government had no power uh, controlling it. So, um, you know, as, as is often said, all great fortunes are built on a crime. And, and that was certainly true about many great American fortunes. Um, and I think it's true about the, the Sassoon fortune as well. Um, one of the great things that David Sassoon did um, was that he took his eight sons and, and after they had spent time in China, he began to send some of them to England uh, because he felt that England was gonna be at the center of world growth in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, and he was right. And his sons um, basically would go to England and they would buy English country houses. Um, they would start sending their children to Eton and they would start hobnobbing with the British aristocracy. And they were incredibly successful, um, basically becoming very close to British aristocrats. Um, the Prince of Wales became a very good friend of the Sassoons. And in fact, the Sassoons um, helped fund his gambling habit. They would also go on weight loss cures with him um, across, um, across Europe. And uh, one after another, all the Sassoon sons were being knighted um, by the British and becoming part of the, part of the British establishment. So you now had these kind of two nodes of the empire, really three, one in India, one in China, and one in London. Well, the brothers were having a great time in London by, by, the, by 1900 or so, uh, the late 1800s or 1900. And nobody was really paying much attention to the business um, back in India and China that was producing all the money. And the last remaining brother who was in uh, uh, India overseeing India and China died prematurely. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what happened next because it talks about the role of women in these families, um, which I think is interesting. And again, kind of, you know, in honor of Ilana shows the, the kind of spirit that existed in these Baghdadi Jewish women and in the Sassoon and Kaduri families, a lot of which has been lost to history, but clearly was very important. So um, 
Flora Sassoon was married to, um, to one of the brothers. And when he died prematurely, um, the family couldn't figure out what to do. And so Flora Sassoon said, uh, look, our son is still a teenager. I will run the company temporarily, almost like a regency, uh, until, uh, until he uh, comes of age, um, sort of as a caretaker. And so the brothers who were in London living the, living the good life um, thought that made sense to them. And so they allowed Flora to, to do this. Now, this is at a time in India where not only women couldn't vote, uh, women actually couldn't even be seen in public, even Western women. They lived under what was called purda. And um, so Flora Sassoon basically starts running the Sassoon Empire from her living room. Um, and it turns out she is an incredibly smart businesswoman and also quite the feminist. And so gradually she begins to visit the Sassoon factory. She goes to the office, which is a bit of a scandal, um, but she's incredibly successful in, in, in terms of the profits that she's producing. At one point, kind of similar to what's going on in, in the world today, there's a, a plague, a, a pandemic comes to uh, Bombay, a bubonic plague. And she has to shut a lot of her factories and a lot of her workers or Indian workers are afraid to come to work. So Flora Sassoon basically funds research for a vaccine. She brings doctors from Europe to India to search for a vaccine. They come up with a vaccine. And she goes out publicly and gets an injection of this vaccine and has a photograph taken of it, which again is something that has never been seen before in India that a, a British woman would get this vaccine. But when her Indian workers see this, they're so amazed that a British woman would risk herself you know, in, to take a vaccine that they all agree to take it as well. Um, so she really is a remarkable figure. But the brothers back in London feel she's getting a little too big for her britches. And they essentially arrange a boardroom coup where they oust her from her position, the brothers take over and reassert control. And Flora Sassoon sails off to London where she becomes a very well-known philanthropist and scholar. And, and that's the history that people talk about and the family talks about, but they don't talk about her remarkable business acumen. As, as someone said to me, you know, she hit the bamboo ceiling. Um, and was, uh, and was uh, essentially driven out by, by her own family. Um, in somewhat the same way, Eli Kaduri, the young man I spoke about who came from Baghdad and worked for the Sassoon, Sassoons, um, he had gone off on his own um, uh, in the late uh, 1900s and himself became a millionaire um, by the late 1890s. And he decided uh, as you know, young men would that he was gonna go to London and find a wife. So he sails to London, um, lands there, and begins to meet people in the British Jewish aristocracy. Um, these are uh, British businessmen who had done very well in Britain, were very prominent uh, in Jewish British society. Um, and he falls in love with uh, Laura Makata, who he marries, and she becomes Laura Kaduri. Now, typically at that time, around 1900, um, he would have married Laura gotten her pregnant and then gone back to China to pursue his business deals. But Laura was a pretty remarkable woman. Um, she had actually traveled quite a bit herself and she was older than Ellie. She was well into her thirties, which was incredibly old for a woman, uh, an unmarried woman at that point. And everyone thought she'd be a spinster, but she and Ellie got married and she said to him, I'm going with you. I'm going back to China with you. And so the two of them landed in Hong Kong. She had two children very quickly and then announces that she was gonna accompany her husband as he traveled across China, you know, building his business and, and doing his business deals. And remarkably, she kept a diary starting in 1900 for the next 18 years, which is remarkable. It's like reading, uh, you know, Catherine Hepburn in the African Queen, as she's kind of going up these rivers in China and seeing gunships and, and wars breaking out and traveling in Shanghai and Beijing and seeing the terrible poverty there, um, you know, dragging her two children um, who were quite young with her. And one of the things that she does is she begins to encourage her husband um, in charity and philanthropy. Now, this was something that very few British imperialists, very few uh, British who were in China 
um, you know, ruling over parts of all these Chinese cities really thought about. Um, and what was interesting was she directed her charity towards girls. She felt it was very important to build schools for girls because she believed that would improve life, not only for girls in China, but, but for everyone in China. Um, it was an incredibly progressive approach. Um, and in many ways, I think she becomes the uh, conscience of the Kaduri family. Um, she helped set up these um, schools for girls across China. Um, and, um, and it's sort of seeing China at, 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 a, at a very much of a, at a ground level. Um, at a certain point, she's tired of all the traveling and she says to her husband, you know, I wanna settle down someplace. We have these boys, we, we need to kind of raise them in one place. So they settle in Shanghai and um, uh, Ellie Kaduri builds, uh, uh, buys a mansion for her, not the Marble Hall mansion, the huge one that, that I saw, but a different one. And um, one, uh, one day while the family is living there, a fire breaks out um, in, this, um, uh, in this mansion and uh, Laura runs out. And when she runs out, she thinks that the Chinese governess who she had hired to take care of her two boys was still trapped inside. So she runs back inside to the burning mansion. It turned out the governess had run out um, through another door and Laura got lost in the smoke and in the fire and died. And this story was obviously not only tragic for the Kaduri family, but it's something the Chinese talked about over and over again. The fact that this British woman would sacrifice her life trying to save a Chinese servant um, was something that they found just remarkable. And her death has an impact obviously not only on the family, but also I think on their future actions and their, their desire to, um, to become philanthropic. Uh, and as I say, she was very much, I think, the conscience of that family, um, even, even after she died. And so after a few years in London where Ellie goes and he's emotionally shattered, he decides to move back to Shanghai. Um, it builds this huge marble hall palace and um, has his two sons, their two sons come and, come and live with him. So we're now in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s. And I have to say that you know, if this pandemic were taking place back then and you were all deciding what's going to be my first trip after the pandemic's over, you would want to go to Shanghai. Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s was just a remarkable place. Um, it was exotic. It was a little naughty. Um, and it was a place that more and more Europeans and Americans wanted to visit um, because it had this incredible reputation. And a lot of that reputation was built by Victor Sassoon. Um, Victor Sassoon uh, was descended from the Sassoons who had gone to London, and like many of those Sassoons, was just living the good life. Um, he went to university at Cambridge. He was always seen with a chorus girl on either arm, and the family basically thought that he would just be one of these playboys who would spend money but never make it. Um, during World War I, he's in a plane crash, and he's uh, left uh, crippled. He loses the use of both of his legs. He has to get around on crutches. And he's convinced that because he no longer has the use of his legs, no one will ever take him seriously and certainly no woman will ever want to marry him. And so he decides to move to India to take over the family business. Um, and he turns out to be a brilliant businessman. And after a few years in India, he decides the future lies in Shanghai. And so he moves to Shanghai um, and moves the entire family fortune there and starts to build. And one of the things he decides to build is the Cathay Hotel, which was the hotel that I went into looking for a bathroom uh, all those many years later. And um, Victor Sassoon enjoyed his money and became both a billionaire and a playboy in Shanghai in 1920s and the 1930s. He gave these incredible parties. Um, he built a hotel that was the finest in Asia. He brought in uh, chefs from Europe and hotel managers and, and the best architects. And then he would hold these parties um, where he would dress up as a ringmaster and everybody who came had to dress up as a circus act, or he would dress up as a schoolmaster and everyone had to dress up as school children. Um, he built a palatial suite for himself at the top of the hotel overlooking Shanghai. And to give you a sense of what Victor Sassoon was like when I visited that, that suite, um, when I was doing the research for the book, um, uh, 
I noticed in the bathroom, which was quite beautiful and quite extravagant, there were two bathtubs. And I, I said to the Chinese fellow who was taking me around, I said, why are there two bathtubs in here? And he said, well, uh, Sir Victor Sassoon always said he didn't mind sharing his bed, but he didn't like sharing his bath. So that gives you a feel for what, what, um, what Shanghai was like. Um, Charlie Chaplin comes to Shanghai to stay with Victor Sassoon at his hotel. Noel Coward goes to the hotel and writes Private Lives in a suite there. Wallace Simpson, who will eventually uh, get the King of England to leave his throne, is photographed in Shanghai wearing only a life jacket. Um, so it was a pretty wild, uh, a pretty wild and crazy place, um, but also a place that was uh, really globalized and was having all these influences from all around the world. And at the same time that um, people like the Kaduris and the Sassoons are living this great life, um, uh, the communists are planning revolution just a mile away. Um, so all these forces are coming together in Shanghai in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, starting in the late 1930s, these cruise ships that are coming to Shanghai, bringing Charlie Chaplin and all the rest, start bringing some different passengers. And these are Jewish refugees. Again, in 1938, 1939, uh, Hitler is, you know, he's conquered Austria. Um, Jews are trying to flee both Austria uh, and Germany. And um, as we know, there was no place for them to go. Uh, almost every country had imposed quotas. They were turning Jewish refugees away. Uh, except in Shanghai, uh, because Shanghai was, pot, was uh, controlled in part by the British, in part by the French, in part by the Japanese, um, there was really no functioning government. And so you didn't need a visa to enter Shanghai. If you were able to get there, you could literally get off the boat and, and find a refuge. Um, so word got back to, um, to Jews, especially in Vienna and Berlin, that if you could raise enough money to buy a ticket on one of these cruise ships, you would be safe if you got to Shanghai. So more and more uh, Jews uh, start to do this. Most of them are middle class. They have the money to be able to buy these, these uh, tickets on these, on these ships. And again, imagine what it was like for them. Most of them, I mean, had, had maybe heard about Shanghai, but they didn't know anything about it. They're arriving in Shanghai, many of them still dressed in their proper Berlin or, or Viennese clothes. Um, they don't speak Chinese. Uh, Shanghai is an incredibly crowded city. There's incredible poverty. And they come pouring over, uh, come pouring off of these ships. And Victor Sassoon, even though he was a playboy, um, I think has one of the great kind of moral moments, um, which is that he decides he has to help these Jewish refugees. Now, Victor was not a very religious man. Um, I often joke that he was far more likely to give a donation to a synagogue than to set foot in one. Um, but Eli Kaduri, who at some times was a rival of Victor's and, and it always felt a little bit in Victor Sassoon's shadow, uh, visits Victor in the Cathay Hotel and he goes up to his suite. And he says to him, Victor, you know, I know you're a playboy, but this is a crisis for our people. And you need to step forward and take a leadership role here. And Victor, to his credit, does. Um, he begins to take many of his buildings and converts them into soup kitchens for these refugees. Um, he hires many of them. He has a lot of property uh, in Hankyu, this poor neighborhood, which he turns over to the refugees. He even flies to South America and tries to buy land that he thinks these refugees might be able to settle so they have a place to go and live permanently, although that, that doesn't work. But most remarkably, he also begins to talk to the Japanese about protecting these Jews. Now, the Japanese at this point um, had basically surrounded Shanghai. Um, they had begun invading China a number of years earlier, and they were advancing on Shanghai, and they occupied part of the city. Um, and the Japanese were anti-Semitic, uh, the military especially. But unlike the Germans, the Japanese believed that while the Jews were the most powerful group in the world, they controlled the economy, they controlled governments, if you were on their good side, they could help you. And they believed that Victor Sassoon, as the most powerful Jew in Shanghai, um, was somebody who might be able to uh, convince Churchill to not declare war against Japan, to keep Roosevelt and the United States out of the war. 
And Victor Sassoon being an incredibly charming guy, uh, did nothing to disabuse them of that notion. So um, the Japanese uh, put an anti-Semitic uh, Japanese colonel in charge of the Jewish problem in Shanghai. And Victor Sassoon would invite this anti-Semitic colonel to his hotel and um, they would have drinks together and he would charm him. He'd say, you know, have your soldiers, um, you know, come to my nightclub and, and enjoy themselves. At the same time he was doing that, he would have, um, he would have his waiters and bartenders spy on the Japanese and report on what they were, what they were saying when they were getting drunk. Um, and he would say to the Japanese, look, you know, um, I will, uh, I will talk to Churchill because he did go, he did go shooting with Churchill. I'll talk to my friends in America to try to keep uh, Roosevelt out of the war. It was almost an elaborate con game. And as a result, these 18,000 refugees who were arriving, the Japanese never took any action against them. The Japanese eventually catch on to what Victor's doing. He needs to flee the country. And yet, even after he left, even after Japan and Germany formed an alliance, uh, even after the Holocaust had begun, the Germans sent uh, people who had overseen the liquidation of um, thousands of Jews in Europe to Shanghai. And they met with the Japanese and they said, you have a, you have a, a Jewish problem here. And the way to solve it is take all the Jews, put them on barges, drag them into the river, and then you can sink them and that'll solve your, your Jewish problem. And the Japanese are appalled by this. And while they do put the Jews in a ghetto, it's nowhere like the ghettos we read about in Europe. Um, it was crowded, there wasn't enough food, it was difficult conditions. But as I say, during World War II, even though the Japanese are allied with the Germans, not a single one of these 18,000 um, Jewish refugees are murdered uh, in, in Shanghai, which is really remarkable. Um, you know, as I've said, you know, the, the, both the Sassoons and the Kaduris were very shrewd and smart businessmen. Um, they weren't great politicians, as it turned out, and neither of them recognized the advance of the communists. So after World War II, they um, returned to Shanghai, assuming things will be the way they were. But within a number of years, the communists have conquered Shanghai. Um, they seize uh, all the Kaduri companies, all the Sassoon companies. Uh, Victor Sassoon leaves, uh, leaves Shanghai. He has a return ticket, but he never goes back. He ends up settling in the Bahamas and is quite bitter about China and losing uh, most of his fortune there. The Kaduris are different. They actually end up um, going to Hong Kong um, where they rebuild their fortune and become richer than ever. Um, and today the Kaduris are the richest Western family in China. They're based in Hong Kong. Um, they own the power company, they own the Peninsula Hotel chain. They meet regularly with the Chinese leadership, including Xi Jinping. Um, and, and their comeback story is, is almost as remarkable um, as what they accomplished uh, in, in Shanghai. Um, and, and, and I think in a way what's so remarkable about both families um, is that it shows, obviously, it's a great business story. It's a story about China. Um, but it's also a story, I think, about choices and moral choices. And, and that was kind of the note I wanted to end on before we turn to questions, which is that in both cases, these families live through an extraordinary amount of history. And at numerous times, but I think especially during World War II, they face this moral choice. Uh, which was what to do about these refugees. Now, remember, both these families were incredibly wealthy. They easily could have just left Shanghai, gone to the US, you know, gone to Australia. They had many options. But in both cases, they not only stayed and suffered the consequences, the Kaduris actually were imprisoned by the Japanese after Pearl Harbor, um, but they decided to step forward and to do everything they could um, to save the refugees and to help them. And I think a lot about that because I think someday, you know, for many of us, people may write our history or the history of this time, and someone like me will be going through the archives and, and asking questions. And I, I think it's, a, it's something that we all need to think about is that when our time comes, when we're presented with a moral challenge, how do we respond? Um, and I think in this case, the Kaduris and the Sassoons um, responded remarkably and admirably 
Um, and that's something that I think I took away from this history, um, which gives me hope that you know all of us, whether in big ways or small ways, when we face these challenges, um, we can step up and then tell our families and tell history um, that we did we did the right thing. Um, so maybe I'll stop uh, at this point, and and Ron, if there are any questions, we can start um, start asking them. Okay, thank you very much. That was great, great, I guess, summary, <laughs> since you have a, a long book in a few minutes. Um, we have a bunch of uh, links in the chat, but no questions per se. But so if people, if they want to write in some uh, questions, please do. Maybe I'll start the questions a little. I was thinking of a few. Um, well, maybe at the end, I mean, what has happened? You say the Kaduri family is still quite wealthy, but what has happened to the Sassoon family? It's a little bit unclear in your book. It's as if they're now middle class and spread all over the world. Right, well, they're better than middle class, so. No, completely? Well, or? no, what, so it was interesting. So um, Victor Sassoon, most of his fortune uh, was in buildings in Shanghai and factories, and he lost most of that. So I wouldn't say that he left poor. He was probably went from being a billionaire to maybe worth, worth tens of millions of dollars. Um, and he settles in uh, the Bahamas. Um, he ends up, his Playboy days are behind him. He ends up marrying his nurse uh, when he's 65 years old. But the other branches of the Sassoon family, so in England, my book's coming out in England next week, and in England, the Sassoons are well known because they became very prominent in British politics and in British culture. Siegfried Sassoon, the great poet from World War I, um, was part of that family. Um, but then there was also part of the family that went to Jerusalem. Uh, and to Israel, and that was interesting. And I, you know, I, I realized that it, it, you know, someone like your wife would have been very valuable because when I went to Jerusalem, um, many of the family archives of the Sassoons had been scattered all around the world. Some were in England, uh, some were in China still, and some were in Jerusalem. And so in Jerusalem, I discovered there was this incredible trove of letters that David Sassoon, the patriarch, had written to his eight sons. And I thought, oh my God, this is incredible to be able to see how this father talked to his sons. So I got to Jerusalem and it turned out that these letters were terrific, but they were all written in Judeo-Arabic, um, which your, your wife um, studied. Now, Judeo-Arabic, I, I got some of these letters and I, I, I emailed them to a friend of mine in Jewish studies because they were all written in Hebrew letters. And she said, these are Hebrew letters, but it's not Hebrew. It's no language I've ever seen. And it turned out that the Jews from Baghdad, including the Sassoons, had spoken this Judeo-Arabic, which is essentially Arabic, but written with Hebrew letters, as I understand it. And it was very useful for the Sassoons because it was like having a code. Remember, Shanghai, when they went there, was an incredibly competitive place. There were all these rivals. Um, there was all this competition. Um, to make money. And when you read various letters from Shanghai, everyone's always warning people saying, you need to be careful, there are spies everywhere. But the Sassoons had this built-in code because only they could speak Judeo-Arabic. Um, that was a problem for me because I don't speak Judeo-Arabic, but I was able to find a professor um, in Jerusalem who did. And I literally sat in his, uh, in his living room for several days, whereas he went through these thousands of letters and said, oh, here's a good one, and then would, would translate it for me. So um, it, it was interesting kind of having to track down um, the, uh, the archives kind of all around the world. But the Sassoons today um, are very prominent in England still in politics. They're very involved in politics. A number of them have become rabbis and scholars and live in Jerusalem and in New York, um, but they never went back. They never went back to China. Um, that's just not a, a part of their lives anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions now, which are a little hard. Um, I mean, one question I had that some, somebody asks, uh, Joshua asks, did you come across anything about the Hardoon family? But I'll just extend that question to say, were they really unique or was there kind of a lot of Iraqi Jews who went around and conquered the world? Right, okay. Um, so if you talk to Iraqi Jews, they will tell you that they were not only the smartest Jews, 
uh, but also the best in business. I mean, they're very proud of that. And Iraqi Jews, I know, in the U.S., even if they left, you know, in the 60s, are, you know, very accomplished and, and kind of feel like they are the aristocracy of the Jewish world, which, you know, we can, you know, it, it's certainly how they feel. Um, so, as I mentioned, one of the things that the Sassoons did was they essentially populated their growing empire with Jews from Baghdad. And as word spread, a lot of Iraqi Jews began to think, wow, this is a great place to go. This is the gold rush. And so you did have this quite substantial Baghdadi Jewish community um, in Shanghai, um, where they built synagogues um, and they had Jewish clubs um, and they were very involved in business. The Sassoons were clearly the most successful and the most accepted by the British. Um, the Hardoon family was one of these families. Hardoon started out as literally a rent collector for the Sassoons and then built up a huge fortune um, and became uh, one of the wealthiest uh, families in Shanghai. Um, I talk about them a little bit in the book. Uh, they're an example perhaps of how families can sometimes undermine their own interests. Um, Hardoon married a woman who was part Chinese and then they decided, he was sort of a quirky guy, and so they then decided to have, they adopted 12 children and they raised half of them as Buddhists and half of them as Jews. And once Hardoon died, everyone started fighting with each other. And that fortune essentially vanished in all these legal battles. Um, they were immensely wealthy, but they were so busy fighting with each other, it all got caught up in, in legal fights. So I felt that the Sassoons and the Kaduris, because they lasted better, and maybe ran their families with more uh, efficiency um, were, were better vehicles to tell this story. Okay. Um, the next question from Kathy Felix, I think is, said they, the question is who did the boy, who did they marry? I right. think, I mean, how did they maintain their Jewishness and, right, I mean, if, if all the men were coming over, what, what if, who were they? Right, they so, do? no, that's, that's a great question. One of the things that was interesting was, when I was in England, I spent time at the archives where you they have all the wills of the various Sassoon um, sons. And they're fascinating to read because um, in the wills, you can almost hear the, the thundering voices where they're saying, you know, you must marry someone from Baghdad, you must stay in the Jewish faith, you know, all these kind of you know, trying to assure that they remain both Baghdadi and Jewish, even as they were entertaining the King of England and, and, uh, and, and living this aristocratic life. Um, many of them intermarried. Uh, many of them married um, into the British uh, or European aristocracy. Um, uh, many of them uh, converted, a couple of them converted. Um, but a number of them did marry uh, Jews from Baghdad. I mean, it is kind of interesting when I was talking about this book with publishers, you meet with various editors and they ask you questions before they offer you a contract. And over and over again, I kept on being asked, is this a Jewish story? Is it a China story? And I kept on saying it's a family story. And in some ways there are kind of family lessons here. So David Sassoon, as I said, had these eight sons who he sent everywhere and kept a pretty tight grip on them, uh, dictating what they could do and so forth. The minute David died, all the boys started fighting with each other. And the, the family in fact splits. And, and, and part of the family does begin to drift away from Judaism. Um, and so while there are a lot of Sassoons now, um, you know, a lot of their journeys have been sort of different from each other. Um, the Kaduris were different. Eli Kaduri, after their mother, after his wife dies, um, they have two sons, Horace and Lawrence. And he basically pulls them out of school in London. Uh, Lawrence was studying to be a lawyer. Horace was studying to be an architect. And he brought them back to Shanghai and said, you know, you're going to work for me. And um, they do, and they do it very successfully. Horace never marries. Lawrence marries a woman descended from someone from Baghdad, another prominent Baghdadi family. Um, but what's interesting is after the war is over, and they fled to Hong Kong, Horace and Lawrence, who are now in their 40s, realized that their father made a mistake. They, they realized with the communists conquering China that they lived in a bubble. They lived in this great mansion, but they never understood 
the inequality and, and, and the communism was going to sort of storm into their lives and, and kick them out of Shanghai. So they decide to do things differently. And one of the things they decide is that they need to understand China better. And they actually get very involved, and this is perhaps the influence of their mother's memory, helping Chinese refugees who are fleeing China and settling in Hong Kong. And they uh, help these Chinese refugees buy small plots of land where they can farm. Um, they fund a lot of research into uh, farming and animal husbandry. They end up helping 300,000 of these refugees. And one of the things they do is to fund research into pigs because pork obviously is a staple of the Chinese diet. And they, they fund ways that these farmers can grow bigger pigs and better pigs to produce more pork. And in fact, the Chinese have this joke they start telling, which is that the Kaduris know everything about pig except what it tastes like because they're, they're, keeping, they're keeping kosher. Um, so, so I think the Kaduris remained in China, they remained in Hong Kong, um, but they did understand that they had to understand China in a deeper way um, than, um, uh, than their father certainly had. Um, okay, thanks. Alice asks, there's no mention of building mikvaot, like mikvahs. Are there, was there that type of community that they built? They built synagogues, they built other institutions? Yeah, there were, I mean, I think there was, I mean, as I say, the, the, the Kaduris and the Sassoons are what we consider reformed Jews, right? They were, I mean, they would go to synagogue if they went at all on the high holidays. Their Judaism was very important to them, um, but there were more Orthodox Jews um, who uh, kept alive uh, the Sephardic tradition and brought that with them to Shanghai. Um, and then there were other Jews in Shanghai, uh, some who came from Russia, um, some of the uh, refugees who came had come from Poland. And so you had these various uh, institutions um, that were there. And in fact, it was interesting that, that Victor Sassoon and the Kaduris were considered the very top, right? They were the wealthy Baghdadi Jews. Um, and I think in some ways, Victor Sassoon looked down on some of the refugees because he thought, you know, these are from these, you know, they're middle class or they're from shtetls and they're not kind of high and mighty like the, the Baghdadi Jews were. So there was always that, a little bit of that kind of tension going on. Um, there's a question similar to one I had. Well, the question from Rabbi David Bachman is, did you follow the Shanghai Jews trail to San Francisco? Yes. Uh, more generally, what happened to them after the war was over? Did they all disperse? Did any of them stay in Shanghai? Well, yeah, no, it was very interesting. I mean, one of the most moving things, and there's actually a wonderful documentary that came out on PBS recently, which you might still be able to stream. It's called Harbor from the Holocaust. Um, and it's about the Shanghai Jewish story. Um, I, I, I'm a, I was a kind of an advisor to it and, and, and talk a lot about the history there, but it was actually made by a, a Chinese woman who came to the US called Harbor from the Holocaust. Um, and it traces these families um, and what happened to both the the Chinese um, and to the Jews um, who were in Shanghai. So a couple of things are very interesting. You know, the, the Jews who came to Shanghai, um, they didn't speak Chinese and the Chinese obviously didn't speak German or, 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 or English. And yet over and over again, the refugees felt that the Chinese were nice to them. And that even though they were living in these very poor conditions, the Chinese would give them food or give their children rickshaw rides. And many of them had fled you know, places where their neighbors were literally chasing them down the street in, in Berlin and Vienna. So the, the refugees were very touched by that. Um, after the war was over, when the Americans liberated Shanghai, the refugees had been cut off from any news. They didn't know what was happening in Europe. And for them, their lives had been very difficult, right? They, there, wasn't, there wasn't enough food, their living conditions were very cramped. But then when they learned what had happened back in Europe, they realized how lucky they had been. And there are these very moving pictures in this documentary and that I talk about in my book where the Americans would print, uh, would, would, would post names of, of people um, and, in villages and how many had died or in Berlin and Vienna. And you see these refugees looking and realizing that everyone was gone back in Europe that they had survived. Um, they all decide to leave, especially when the communists come. Um, they go to Palestine, they go to Australia, they go to San Francisco, they go to America. Um, and many of them become quite prominent. Uh, Michael Blumenthal, who was the Treasury Secretary under Jimmy Carter, 
um, was a refugee, Peter Max, you may remember his posters in the 60s, always talked about how he learned to draw uh, from his Chinese maid who took care of him in Shanghai, um, Hollywood executives. So that was a community where the children and, and grandchildren um, are a very vibrant part of Jewish life. Um, and they're all around because their uh, their families had made it to Shanghai. Did you answer, what was the connection to San Francisco? Oh, so San Francisco, there's a fast, so um, there's a rabbi, uh, so there's a, a, a young man, he's a teenager. Uh, he flees Berlin uh, with his family um, and they take a ship and they eventually end in Shanghai. Um, his name is uh, Ted Alexander. And again, Shanghai, even though the Jews were forced to live in a ghetto in a restricted area, there was a vibrant Jewish life. There were synagogues there. Um, in fact, there were music groups. It was a very typical Jewish community, right? There were two music groups and they were rivals. There were rival synagogues. I mean, it was kind of everything we love about the diversity of Jewish life, even under these terrible conditions. And there was a, a kind of makeshift seminary. And so uh, Ted Alexander decided he wanted to study to be a rabbi. And there were three rabbis who were refugees. Um, and so they formed a, a, a group that um, uh, made him a rabbi. And um, uh, after the war, he was actually employed by Victor Sassoon um, as a clerk in one of Victor Sassoon's companies. When Victor Sassoon had to flee, he continued to pay. He got money uh, to Ted Alexander, even through the war. And after the war, Victor Sassoon asked him to stay on. But Alexander decides he wants to go back. He's met another refugee who he marries, and he decides to move to San Francisco. Now, they had fled, the Alexander family had fled Berlin um, right after Kristallnacht. And they had rescued one of the Torahs from their synagogue that was destroyed during Kristallnacht, brought it to Shanghai, kept it in their small, you know, tenement apartment in Shanghai. And then Ted Alexander, when he boarded the ship for San Francisco with his wife, took it with him and brought it to San Francisco. And so today you can go to the synagogue that he became the rabbi of in San Francisco. And that Torah that started in Berlin, made it to Shanghai, and then made it to San Francisco is still there. So it's a pretty remarkable testament to the survival um, of, of Jews and the extraordinary lengths they went to um, to preserve uh, to preserve the Torah. Thanks. Okay, my son Noam asks. It sounds like figures like Victor and Eli, Eli were at the top of their organizations. How did things look at the customer level, especially with the Chinese government being opposed to the opium trade? So, yeah, I mean it, it, that's a great question. I mean, what's interesting is for both these families, and again, they, they're 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 in China for 175 years. The Sassoons are, you know, are incredibly influential. The Kaduris are incredibly influential starting in the 1840s through today. No one in any of those families ever bothered to learn Chinese, which I think tells you everything you need to know about them being at the very top. And then, you know, working through Chinese staff and so forth, um, lower down. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that the Sassoons and the Kaduris were imperialists, they were colonialists, and a lot of their fortune, whether it was from opium or later on in factories, um, did contribute to the inequality and, and all the issues that led to the, the rise of the rise of communism. But I would also say we need to look at them, we can judge them from the 21st century, but we also have to look at kind of, you know, their times. And I do think that, you know, kind of like Michael Bloomberg or kind of wealthy and powerful Jews today, they're businessmen, but they tend to be on the liberal side of things. You know, they may not be Bernie Sanders liberals, but they, they tend today often to be, as most Jews are, uh, more liberal Democrats and so forth. The Kaduris and the Sassoons politically were very conservative. They were imperialists. They did, you know, clearly exploit Chinese labor. But as I say, at the same time, it is true, they probably paid better wages than many other of the foreign companies did. Um, they did give more to charity. And certainly in Hong Kong, the Kaduris did a lot for the Chinese who lived in Hong Kong and, and they're seen as kind of benevolent, even though they're immensely wealthy. So, you know, it's a complicated legacy, but we have to embrace the complexity of it, I think. 
Yes, I was going to ask you also about the moralism of the whole thing, but you kind of answered that. Um, there's a question from a couple of people about of people related to the Sassoons. I know Ilana was not related. Sasson, I think, is the same as Sassoon, but there's, it's a common name and there was no relation. Uh, somebody asked, uh, uh, Barbara asked if Vidal Sassoon was related. No, Vidal Sassoon was not related. Are there other famous Sassoons? Um, well, in England, there are. I mean, certainly in England, the, the name is very well known. In fact, one of the great stories I tell in the book is James Sassoon, who's the head of the family now, pretty much in London, very prominent uh, politician. He was the economics minister in one of the British governments under David Cameron. And it was interesting. He finally went back to China um, when he was negotiating a trade agreement for Britain. Uh, the prime minister sent him over. He was the economics minister. And um, he went to meet with uh, the finance minister of China. And it was a very formal meeting, as these meetings often are, with translators and so forth. And James Sassoon, who's sort of a, he's, a, he's an impish guy, started out by saying to the finance minister, um, the finance minister said to him, I want to welcome you back, welcome the Sassoons back. Your family is very well known in China, um, and we're glad that you've returned. And James Sassoon says to him, well, you know, Mr. Minister, um, if you did what the Eastern European countries did after communism, when they returned a lot of property to people who had invested before, if you had returned our property to us, we'd be a lot wealthier. Uh, I'd be a lot wealthier than I am today. And so the Chinese finance minister leaned over and in English said, let's let bygones be bygones. So, you know, I, I think that, that the Sassoons are very well known in political and diplomatic circles. Um, and, and I think there's gonna be a lot of interest in them because one of the things that happens when the communists are advancing is the Sassoons are trying to smuggle out their artwork. They've collected one of the world-class collections of Chinese ivories in Shanghai. And there's a lot of letters back and forth that I saw from Victor Sassoon trying to figure out how to get this out of China before the communists come in. And he ends up bribing an American Navy captain to put it on an American ship and they kind of get it out. And no one's ever quite known whatever happened to it. And it turned out it made its way to London, was held secretly for all these years and was just given to the British Museum. And so the famous Sassoon ivories are gonna be put on display in, uh, in, um, uh, in London. And I think that exhibit is also gonna to come to the uh, Jewish Museum in New York at some point. So um, that, that history is gonna is going to be coming back soon. Okay, uh, Frida asks, how long were they involved in the opi opium trade? Well, the Sassoons were involved pretty much, uh, I mean, they essentially dominated the opium trade from the 1870s until opium was made illegal uh, in about 1912, 1913. And the Sassoons, because they were so influential, um, basically fought tooth and nail against banning the opium trade. Um, there's all sorts of letters where they're protesting it. Now, one thing I should also note, there are also an awful lot of letters from their rivals filled with anti-Semitism. I mean, the, the British had a kind of social anti-Semitism, which is pretty shocking, I think, uh, to us today. Um, they kept on referring to the Sassoons and the Kadoris in private letters uh, as Jew boys and the big nosed Jews. Um, and even Churchill at one point, um, when the Prince of Wales, who had a circle of Jewish acquaintances and the Sassoons were very close to the Prince of Wales. When he became king, Churchill writes a letter where he says, I wonder if the new king will bring his Jews with him. So there was a way in which the British welcomed the Sassoons money and they loved going to their parties, um, but socially they were never fully, uh, fully accepted. Um, and, and I think that's something that both families um, always had to always had to reckon with, even as they became immensely wealthy and and well connected. Uh, Cantor Ronita Wolfhanan asks: Is there any truth to the story of the European yeshiva head who arranged for visas for his entire yeshiva population to go to Shanghai? Yes, Other yes. Than that, why the Germans hate the Jews? The yeshiva head said, "Because we are Asian." Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the Germans hated the Jews for a lot of other reasons. Um, you know, that is true that as part of this refugee group, one of the last groups um, that gets there 
um, is this yeshiva uh, from Poland. Um, and, um, and they were, they were protected. And, and I guess one of the things that's so moving to me, I guess, is that again, you know, these, these businessmen, Sassoon, Kaduris, they weren't social workers. They didn't really know, and they didn't know what was gonna happen. And so they were just trying to help people and, 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 bring, them, and bring them in. And, and I think Victor found it very moving to sort of meet these Jews from Europe which is both a connection to Judaism, but also to see how, how desperate they were. And I, I think when the yeshiva arrived too, that was kind of another reminder of how bad things were becoming in Europe for the Jews and, and spurred these really businessmen um, to do whatever they could to try to protect them. I said next two questions together. Did they bring over rabbis too? And what Jewish institutions did the Sassoons and Kadoris leave behind in Shanghai and Hong Kong? Well, uh, in Shanghai, there are numerous synagogues um, that were built by the Sassoons and other prominent uh, Jewish families. Um, when the communists took over, they closed them all because religion was illegal in China. Um, one of them actually, they turned into a, an insane asylum. And in fact, there's this incredible story where uh, they go into this synagogue uh, when the communists march into Shanghai, they march in and they go to the um, to the ark, which was built into the wall uh, where the Torah was. They take out the Torah and they replace it with a, a portrait of Chairman Mao uh, to kind of signal that you know the the communists have taken over. Uh, they've now um, rebuilt uh, and restored a couple of these synagogues. One of them is a terrific museum of the refugees. If you go to Shanghai. Um, it's a very well done museum um, that tracks the history of the, the, Jewish, the Jewish refugees. Uh, in Hong Kong, the Kaduris and the Sassoons built synagogues as a thriving Jewish community there, mostly expatriates who were there. But again, given all that's going on in Hong Kong right now with China cracking down, I think the Kaduris, as wealthy and as they are, are a little nervous that could this be Shanghai all over again? Will they need to, to flee one more time? So I, I think it's also uh, nervous times, uh, nervous times for them. That's a good segue to the next one because Shmuel asks when, I tell, when, we were, when they were in Shanghai at the Jewish Museum, they said that the reason the Japanese did not turn over the Jews to the Germans was because Schiff and other Jewish Wall Street bankers underwrote the Japanese versus the Russians in the Russo-Japanese war. It was their quote, honorable way, unquote, to pay back the Jewish people. No, that's very true. I mean, what, so the, the history of Japan and Jews is interesting. So you're right, you know, Japan and China both open up at the same time. Um, China kind of collapses and is invaded by the British and others who begin to carve it up. Japan decides to kind of rally and learn everything they can from the West. And by 1905, they want to go to war with Russia. And they send the finance minister to London, where he meets Jacob Schiff, who's very prominent in American Jewish organizations. And of course, in 1905, the Jews have no love for Russia, right? I'm, my family is here because they fled uh, Russia uh, around that time um, because of the pogroms and so forth. And so um, uh, Schiff decides to help finance, create a syndicate to give the Japanese billions of dollars to build their Navy. And that's where this idea develops that the Jews are powerful. They do have a huge economy um, and control over the economy, but if we're on their side, they can help us. I'm not sure it was honor that drove the Japanese. This anti-Semitic captain uh, I write about, who Victor Sassoon kind of charms, writes a letter at one point when he's in Shanghai to his superiors in Tokyo. And he says, the Jews are like fugu. Fugu is this Japanese fish that if you slice it the wrong way, it's poisonous and it can kill you. But if you slice it the right way, it's delicious. And so he says, the Jews here in Shanghai are like fugu. If we treat them the right way, they can help us. But if we treat them the wrong way, they could be poisonous to us. So I think it was a very practical uh, thing that was going on where the Japanese thought we can have some advantage keeping these Jews almost like hostages. And if Victor Sassoon can help use them as a bargaining chip, that'll, that'll help us. I think that was more of what was going on. Okay, we're getting a little later. So if you get tired, let me know. We still no, have fine. questions. Um, KB says, thank you for a fantastic presentation. What about the future of the Kaduri family who's still in Hong Kong? Uh, 
Well, you know, I, I think they're, I think it's a nervous time for them. As I said, they're incredibly wealthy and influential, but I think one of the things they're realizing, and this is something I think all American companies and all Western companies are dealing with, is that, you know, China is a very powerful country. And the days when businesses or businessmen could go in and kind of tell China what to do have disappeared. And so the Kaduris have always been very careful not to criticize China publicly. Um, they're huge investors uh, in China. As I say, they meet with Xi Jinping and others regularly, and they're trying to kind of trod this tightrope um, where they can retain a sense of, you know, morality, but still work within China. And I think this is something that, you know, Google is dealing with and Microsoft and Zoom. I mean, everyone is trying to figure out how do you deal with China, especially when they're going through this repressive um, period. Um, I think Michael Kadori, who's the head of the family now, who's in his 70s, is very romantic about China. He really led the Kadoris back to China. Uh, the Chinese welcomed the Kadoris back for investment. Um, he got to meet, he remembered growing up in Shanghai and riding his tricycle along the huge veranda of the family mansion. I'm not sure the younger members of the family have quite that affection. And I suspect they bring a bit more harder nosed attitude um, to things. And it'll be interesting to see um, how, this, how this plays out. Uh, ben asks, who was the professor who translated the Judeo-Arabic letters for you? You may know. Oh, you know what? His, his name is in the book. It slips, uh, it slips my mind right now, but he's a, he was a very helpful guy and I thank him in the book, so. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I understand the next one, so I'll skip it. Um, um, well, Joshua says, the Sassoon's established a trust that provides funds for synagogues with Jewish day school in the JCC in Hong Kong. Right. That's the case. Um, what are you kind of just answered? What are your your expectations for the prominent Jews that are still in Hong Kong and Shanghai? Well, I mean, I think their fate will be very much tied to Hong Kong's fate. Um, I think it's one of the things that the Sassoon's and the Kaduri's learned in Shanghai that when the communists took over, it didn't matter that they were rich or influential. Um, it didn't matter when the Japanese took over. You know. Um, the Kaduris were imprisoned and Ali Kaduri actually died in Japanese captivity. I suspect that um, many Western companies will start leaving Hong Kong. I mean, as a journalist, a lot of the newspapers and news organizations have already left. Um, and, um, and I think that the Jews who are in Hong Kong, um, many of them are there for business and they may have to leave as well. One thing that is interesting is that my book is gonna be published in Chinese uh, and translated and published in China, which surprised me because I thought, given the state of US-China relations, I, I wasn't sure they would do that. But it's a government kind of think tank that's gonna be publishing the book. And, and that says to me that there may be a desire in China among some people to remember a time when Shanghai and China were more open and more cosmopolitan and had these Jews and other immigrants living there and contributing to the society. So um, obviously we don't know what's gonna happen. I think short term, there will be a crackdown and I think Hong Kong will, will suffer for it. But, but my hope is that as in America, things change and China too may enter a period um, where, you know, they'll recognize the richness of their history. And this is something that Kaduri's believe in very much. When I've talked to Michael Kaduri recently, he, his attitude is, I wish China and America would both come to their senses and kind of find a way to work together, which would obviously be good for him and for the family, but I think he believes would also just be good for, for the world and for you know, stability. Um, maybe, maybe one more question. Um... Well, both families seem to have taught their children resilience in the face of many obstacles. How did they do that? You know, that's a great question. And, and I, I think, you know, this is where sort of Jewish values may matter. Um, I, 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 I think about this a lot because as I say, neither family was very religious. Um, the Kaduris today, they go to synagogue for the holidays. Um, the Sassoons really, um, never were never, never were that religious um, after the, you know, probably after 1920 or so. And yet it's clear that Jewish values were really important to them. 
And I think you see whether it's helping the refugees or helping the Chinese refugees, um, you know, all the things they did, they always talk about Jewish history. And the other part that's interesting is that the Chinese really respect Jews. You know, the, the, the Chinese, when they talk to Jews, it's one of the few places in the world that actually seems philo-Semitic to me. Um, and of course they believe Jews are good at business, but they also respect Jewish education. They talk about Jewish family values. And they're really curious about that and, and, and interested in it. And so I, I think that the Chinese admire the resilience of the Jewish people. Um, they admire the way in which these family values are passed on. And I guess one thing I liked about learning about these families is that they seem like many of us, right? So much Jewish history is about great Jewish scholars and, and, um, and great Jewish thinkers, or it's about the Holocaust. And those are all incredibly important. But the Kaduris and the Sassoons could be, you know, they could be members of your of your congregation or my congregation. You know, they they could be, you know, endowing chairs at Columbia. I mean, they're they're they very much lived as secular Jews, but their Jewish uh, values were very important to them. And, and I think that's why the book resonates for me, and I think for many American Jews today, because it is a story of how your Jewish values aren't just something you do on the high holidays or, you know, on a Saturday at synagogue. It's something that whether you realize it or not is gonna infuse your life, even when you're, you know, the richest, one of the richest families in the world and, and meeting with Churchill and, you know, and, and, and helping China rise. Um, so I think that's at the root of a lot of their family success, but I think also helped shape who they were and maybe made them different than other business titans or or politicians that we that we often read about it was kind of nice to to read about people where you thought um these were people who i can recognize who i can you know maybe identify with somehow okay thank you so much there's a few more posts thanking you for a great presentation and story and book and uh yeah we really appreciate the time you took to tell us the story Thanks very much, I really yeah, I'll give you a virtual applause. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Say goodbye. Okay. Okay. Bye -bye. Yes, you can also. Okay.